So today's sermon uh, is a topic that came out of a discussion that I had with a coworker last year in Arizona. And the information that I got for our, uh, our uh, discussion today, I'll call it a discussion, uh, came from the um, Hope for Humanity series. It's the uh, Young Disciple Lessons. And they are so rich that I thought it would be helpful to share with you. And I also took some excerpts from The Great Controversy. So I would just like to start out by saying, I would like to share with you um, a selection of passage from The Great Controversy. If you've ever read this book, uh, I would suggest reading it again. And if you have not read the book, I would suggest reading it. Um, a lot of times the beginning of the great controversy seems to be long and drawn out. And it's that way because the book, the great controversy is a book of history. It is the history of our world. And, um, I'm going to give you a little excerpt here. So I'm going to talk about some people named Tyndale, Latimer, Weishart, Knox, Ridley, and Cranmer. Cranmer. These are the later English reformers. While Luther was opening a closed Bible to the people of Germany, Tyndale was impelled by the Spirit of God to do the same for England. Wycliffe's Bible had been translated from the Latin text, which contained many errors. It had never been printed, and the cost of manuscript copies was so great that few but wealthy men or nobles could procure it, and furthermore, being strictly prescribed by the church, it had had a comparatively narrow circulation. In 1516, a year before the appearance of Luther's thesis, Erasmus had published his Greek and Latin version of the New Testament. Now, for the first time, the Word of God was printed in the original tongue. In this work, many errors of former versions were corrected, and the sense was more clearly rendered. It led many among the educated classes to a better knowledge of truth and gave a new impetus to the work of reform. But the common people were still to a great extent, debarred from God's word. Tyndale was to complete the work of Wycliffe in giving the Bible to his countrymen. A diligent student and an earnest seeker of truth, he had received the gospel from the Greek Testament of Erasmus. He fearlessly preached his convictions, urging that all doctrines be tested by the scriptures. To the papist claim that the church had given the Bible and the church alone could explain it, Tyndale responded, Do you know who taught the eagles to find their prey? That same God teaches his hungry children to find their father in his word. Far from having uh, given us the scriptures, it is you who have hidden them from us. It is you who burn those who teach them. And if you could, you would burn the scriptures themselves. The grand principle maintained by these reformers, the same that had been held by the Waldenses, by Wycliffe, by John Huss, by Luther, Zwingli, and those who united with them, was the infallible authority of the holy scriptures as the rule of faith and practice. They denied the right of popes, councils, fathers, and kings, the control of conscience in matters of religion. The Bible was their authority, and by its teaching, they tested all doctrine and all claims. It comes from chapter 14, later English Reformers, it's pages 245 uh, through 249, the book, The Great Controversy. So our scripture today was 1 Peter 3.15, which says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. And um, 
I actually had that happen to me. But I could not fully give my answer with meekness and fear. In fact, I couldn't fully give the answer. Have you ever been in a position like that? I had a coworker. He said, hey, Fred, you know how Paul talks about being in the body? But, uh, but then he talks about being out of body and in the spirit. Um, so what, what do you believe, Fred? Because uh, that text talks about the immortal soul. Paul's talking about the immortal soul. And so um, I said, well, I don't really believe that in the immortal soul. But it led to further discussion. So I couldn't really give it. So today we're going to learn a really good way of how to do that. So the Bible should, um, I just want to read a quote from Steps to Christ, page 91. Never should the Bible be studied without prayer. Before opening its pages, we should ask for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, and it will be given. That's an amazing promise, right? So when we ask God for the Holy Spirit, he'll send it. That's the recipe, and that's how it happens. So I'm going to give you the bullet points uh, for today's study. The first one is the winning combination. Uh, and the second one is deadly ignorance. So I'm going to give you the titles, and maybe you can try to figure out what these might be. The second one is deadly ignorance. The third one is saving knowledge. The fourth one is blessings. The fifth one is more blessings. And then the sixth one is ready, trigger, mark. So our first point that I would like to bring out is a winning combination. The Bible says that we should always be ready to give an answer, right? Or maybe a defense right? For the hope that's in you, right? We just read that, right? First Peter, right? So that's amazing, right? So do you want to be able to explain your faith with those who ask? Of course we do. And so like me, you ask, can I do that, right? Well, there's a recipe. So our part to doing that starts by looking at a text, John 5, 39. So I'm going to give the first text, John 5, 39. Which says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So what's the first thing that we have to do? Search the scriptures, right? Here's the companion text, and that is Acts 17, 11. Acts 17, 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So our part is to search and study the scriptures so you can know for yourself what you believe, right? So we got to search and study. So what's God's part? Because God has a part in this, right? Because we're working with heaven in this, uh, in this recipe. It's always a recipe, right? So it's kind of like cooking in the kitchen, right? Sometimes you get enough. Last week, the lesson talked about um, uh, the idea of salt came up. And uh, what happens when you get a large amount of salt in one area? <laughs> it becomes yuck, yuck, doesn't it? Too much. What happens when you take that huge amount of salt and you kind of just sprinkle it out? Uh, nice and lightly. It makes food become yum yum. Even so much so 
that salt is one of the main ingredients in ice cream. You ever heard of that? Ice cream salt? Right. So let's look at God's part in this equation. And that is in James chapter 1, verse 5. James chapter 1, verse 5. which says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So this is a text which illustrates God's part, but it also identifies our part as well, and that's that we have to ask, right? What happens if you don't ask for something? You don't get it. It's like cake. I use this illustration at work all the time. If you want cake, you got to ask for it, don't you? And the, the, the response is always yes, yes. We always want to ask because then we receive. Sometimes you don't get it. But if you never ask, you never get. All right. So then you'll be able to understand what you study, right? When we ask... Um, when we have an opportunity to share with someone, God brings what we have learned back to our remembrance, right? That's what he does. And he does that because in John 14, 26, it says, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. That's a promise from Jesus, isn't it? Yes. It tells us that he will bring it back to our remembrance. So how do we remember something? Because we've studied it, and we've searched it out, and we've read it, right? And he brings it back. If you want to understand a doctrine correctly, Whose will must you be willing to do? God's will, right? John 7, 16 says that. So in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 13, the Lord calls us his witnesses, right? So let's look at that. Isaiah chapter 31 no, oh, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. Verses 1 through, it's kind of a long text, 1 through 13. But this is a chapter that talks about Jesus as being the Savior. And in specifically uh, verse 10, Jesus says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. There was no God formed, neither shall be after me. So God says that we are his witnesses. And uh, this word witnesses here means somebody that is duplicating. So God calls us his witness and his servant. So what does God do? So he redeems us, right? Yes. Right? He saves us and he redeems us. So if we're a witness of God... That means we should have the same approach. We should want to redeem people and save them, right? So how do you do that? What would be your response? It would be to have a willing heart. And the result of that would be success, right? Because you'd be working with God. So... 
In John 14, 26, that's the text that we just talked about, sending the comforter to us, right? Will we remember something if we have never learned it? Can the Holy Spirit bring it to our remembrance if we haven't studied it? No. You cannot bring something to mind you have not remembered. But you can bring something to mind that you have experienced or you read or you've seen, right? Something, a personal experience. So that's our first approach. Our first approach is a winning combination. We need to be connected with Jesus in such a way that we are receptive to the Holy Spirit's leading and the Holy Spirit brings things to mind that we have studied or learned in God's word and you will have something ready to share with people you bump into. And that will spurn discussion and comment. And that's the first bullet point. That's the winning combination. That's how you win. So we can, we can go home now because I've given you everything. Right? Well, let's go to the second bullet point. Deadly ignorance, right? It can be deadly to be ignorant of God and his word, right? Hosea 9 Excuse me, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? That's a common text. It's good to have a lot of enthusiasm for God, right? But if our love for him is not based on what we know about him, it'll be useless, won't it? It will be enthusiasm that is not God-based, right? The desire of Paul's heart was for the people of Israel to be saved, but he saw something standing in the way of their salvation. Let's look at that in Romans 10, verses 1 through 3. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Oh, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, for Israel, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So catch that. This is kind of like a, like a cold shower moment. Have you ever like uh, felt the water on a shower and it feels just right? You hop in there and ooh, it's a little, it's not quite warm enough yet. Like the hand felt it was okay, but when the body felt it, it wasn't okay, right? So they had a zeal for God, but it was not according to knowledge, right? Their enthusiasm was misplaced. Here's why this is dangerous. In Isaiah 64, um, verses 1 through 6, uh, we read that um, our righteousness is as filthy rags, isn't it? So what happens when we try to do something on our own without God working for us, right? It, it gets misplaced. And a lot of people like to use that text, but there is one that I like a lot better than that text, and it's in Isaiah 28, verse 20. And you should look that one up, Isaiah 28, 20. That's the one that I like better. It's cryptic language, folks, so let's work our ways through this. For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. 
very cryptic. Who, who, can, who picks up on this? Let me give it to you another way. Yes, it'd be hard to get a good night's sleep. The, anyone else have a good illustration for this text? It just doesn't get it done. It's like getting into heaven with your own righteousness. It just won't happen, right? It just doesn't get the job done. So Isaiah 5.13 lists several of the evils that can come to God's people, right? So one of the evils is no knowledge, and men become famished, and then they become thirsty. So those are the things that happen to us. And it's usually something that happens when we um, have a separation. So these things happen because we're ignorant. And we do things our way. And we tend not to include God in them. Amos 8.11 says, these things happen because there is a famine for God's word. When we do not study the scriptures, when we do not try to understand what God wants for us, we experience famine. Yes. Today's Sabbath school lesson talked about Abraham and how he experienced a famine in the land of Canaan. And he had to go to Egypt. And I wonder if it's because there was a famine for God's word. Maybe. We don't, I don't have anything to substantiate that on, but usually famine for God's word produces uh, an emptiness. So if we dig a little deeper, uh, let's read a text in Isaiah 5, verses 20 through 24. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 to 24. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. So what do those who lack a knowledge of God and his word do? They become wise and prudent in their own eyes. They end up drinking wine and strong drink. And they attempt to justify their wickedness for reward. Do you see that? It plays out. And the final culmination to that is they take away the Christian experience. This activity takes away the Christian experience. And this used to be something that I partook of when I was younger. So it's really um, important that we look at God's word and say, what is it that you want me to do for my life? What do you want me to do um, Yes, that's a good point. Take charge and help me follow. So there are some promises that I would like to share with you that um, are an encouragement in this area. And there are three of them. And I'll give it to you really quick. The first one is Psalms 36.10, which says, O oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. 
The second one is Hosea 13, 5. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. And the third one is John 17, 3, which says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's, it, should just, it should just be like water. A lot of times, David was like on the run. He was thirsty. And he had these moments where he was like, oh. And something happened, and it was like drinking water. I've identified with some of this because I've, um, when I go out on the road, I like to go hiking, and a lot of times I'll try to summit high points um, that, I, um, that I am working close to. And so the last place that I worked in was uh, central Arizona. And while I was there, I summited several of the peaks in central Arizona. And so they were uh, fairly challenging peaks if you don't get lost. Um, the other thing that is so important is to take water. Water is one of the most essential components to hiking in the, in the, in the, um, in anywhere really, because you, you end up getting thirsty because you're exerting yourself. And so if you run out of water, that's a problem. So, um, God's word is like water. So when we're thirsty, we can drink in God's word. So we've talked about um, the winning combination, right? And that's working with God and how deadly ignorance can separate us, what happens when we're separated from God. So I'm gonna, the third point that I'd like to touch on is saving knowledge. God gives us a special knowledge in allowing us to study and memorize his word. When we place his word in our heart, our foolish human thoughts are replaced with his wonderful, perfect thoughts. Right? And that comes from Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. When God's thoughts fill our minds, something happens in our mouths. He gives us the tongue of the learned, just as he did Jesus, doesn't he? Yes. He places that in us. Then we can speak words of hope and encouragement to those who are weary with the burden of sin. God puts words in our mouth. Have you ever experienced that? Yes. Have you ever had something flash into your mind while you were talking with somebody? Maybe a text or an illustration from the Bible? This is something we need to work on so that we can give... Um, water to someone who's thirsty. As we place more and more of God's words in our minds, we become always ready to give an answer to every person who asks us to give them a reason for the hope that is in us, right? And that's our scripture text, 1 Peter 3.15, right? Giving the, the, an answer for the hope that is in you, right? This isn't so that we will look smart. It's so that those who are seeking for truth can find the answers they need to be part of God's kingdom. So if we want to be wise, what's a wise person going to do? Let's look at this in Proverbs 1, 5. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. Proverbs is a really cool book. If you're curious for something to do, um, just read one chapter a day. Lasts about five to seven minutes. And it'll take you one month and you'll get through the whole book. But you'll learn a lot of advice. Proverbs 1.5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. So that means I'm going to listen, right? I'm going to listen to good counsel. What happens? 
I got to ask for that good counsel. So one thing that I have noticed is that people who are highly successful surround themselves with people who are successful as well. So if I'm in a business, that means putting good people with accounting skills around me or people who have good counsel. Maybe there's something legal that I need to discuss with a lawyer. Maybe there's something good I need to discuss with uh, someone. Maybe I want to buy some property. I should talk with a title consultant, right? I should talk with somebody who is knowledgeable in that area. Ask as many questions as possible so that I can become knowledgeable. And God's word is like that. Asking questions to God is like reading his word, right? Because God is telling us what we need to know. So that is our next, um, that is saving knowledge. Our next point is blessings. We gain knowledge when we study and memorize the Bible, but this is just the beginning of what God has for us when we do these things. There are many more blessings awaiting us when we take time to place God's word in our minds. And so I have just a few of them for you here. We have a powerful tool to overcome sin, which is hiding God's word in our heart, and it helps Keep, and it keeps us from committing sin against God. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, right? So what kept David from sinning? God's word in his heart. He remembered it. We have strength to meet Satan's attacks. The Bible tells us that the word of God is sharper than to any two-edged sword, right? Uh, that means Satan can't stand against it, can he? Right? So because of that, we have more joy than we thought possible. Jeremiah 15, 16 tells us what happens when we eat God's word and make it a part of ourselves, right? So uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. Let's look this up. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So he found it. Um, when he ate God's word, he made it a part of himself. Um, it changed, right? He, he internalized what he was reading, and it changed him, right? Ezekiel also talks about this. In Ezekiel chapter thir 3, verses 1 through 4, we have the same approach. The same eating... Something is eaten, and we'll just take a quick peek at this. Ezekiel 3, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak for my words unto them. 
So why did God want Ezekiel to do this? Well, because he needed a personal experience. Once he had heard God's word, what was his responsibility? It was to share and speak with the house of Israel in this text. And the application of this is that we should do the same, right? We should do the same. So we should have more blessings. Here's something that we can do. We can use the minds that God gave us to memorize his word. What God does is he showers us with all sorts of blessings. We've already studied several amazing blessings that come from memorizing scripture. Today we'll find even more. In our Bible study, as we remember text, we have memorized our understanding grows. Right? Precept upon precept, line upon line. Memorization of scripture is a way of beholding Jesus, or the word. When we do this, we are changed, we are transformed into his image from glory to glory, right? That's what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. So the Bible is jam-packed with all kinds of promises that God has made for us. Um, there are promises for help and guidance. Psalms 48, 14 says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. God also promises his faithfulness. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. That's Isaiah 54, 10. God also promises our salvation. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is, it's the gift of God. That's Ephesians 2, 8. God also promises wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in blamelessness. Proverbs 2, verses 6 and 7. God promises peace, joy, and love. Peace I give to you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, but I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's John 14, 27. God also promises riches in heaven, in my Father's house, in my Father's house, in God's house are many mansions. That's a big house. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's John 14, 2. God promises adoption into his family. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. Power, the word power there is dynamite. Power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. John 1, 12. God also promises strength and power. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36, 27. God also promises his provision. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Job 36, 11. God promises eternal life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. John 8, 51. And there's more and more and more and more. So, would you like to be able to quickly turn your Bible to a text of any important Bible subject? Would you like to be able to give a whole Bible study on a subject, beginning with that first text? In this section, ready, trigger, mark, we'll discuss that. The first text 
in a section could be the, the text that you memorize, like today's text, the hope that is in you, the hope of glory, right? It's our, it's our text for today. So you could have that as the first text in your Bible, and then from there you could mark in your Bible each succeeding verse so that you could have a Bible study with somebody and you could share that with them. If that's not something that you can do, there are also Bible stickers that you can do. I had a friend of mine that I studied with when I took baptismal lessons, and he gave me a series of stickers, and I have them in the back of my Bible. And each sticker is like um, five or six different um, lessons, and they're all on different topics. Um, like uh, the Godhead, born again, baptism, victory, the law, the Sabbath, the sanctuary, the judgment, the death, the second coming. And each one of those was like just a little five minutes study, you know, just a couple texts, and you could go through that. And that would be something you could do. And you could mark that in your Bible, or you could keep that. There are chain reference studies where you can buy the little stickers and you could put them on the first verse and then this, each sticker goes to a next succeeding verse. And so that's the, the ready trigger mark, being ready. So the first uh, one we talked about was the winning combination, being ready to answer, right? Our second topic was deadly ignorance, which is abstinence from God. Our third topic was saving knowledge. That was a memorization of God's word. Our fourth topic is blessings, being ready like a two-edged sword, and more blessings where our character becomes transformed into God's image. And the final was ready trigger mark, memorization of texts, memorization of God's word. In closing, it's wonderful to know how to give answers for our faith, isn't it? What gift from God helps us to do this in a way that he can honor it? Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So just having the right approach, having something to say at the right time and at the right place.